Hello everyone, I am Tanvi Kaur and I welcome you to this series called RBI 247. In this very series, we pick up some important financial topics and we try to discuss them with the help of different questions. So before beginning up with the session today, for all those who are watching this video for the very first time, you can subscribe to our channel and press this bell icon for all latest updates and notifications. You can also join our telegram group where we share some free quizzes, the updates for all our videos and you can also post your quiz is over here. So before moving on to the very first question, there is another piece of information which I would like to share with you all. So we have we have launched the RBI Grade B 2022, 2022 course for you all. So let us just discuss in brief that what we are going to provide in this very course. What are the perks for enrolling in this course? So you will be helped with both phase one as well as phase two preparation. You will be provided with comprehensive video lessons, then the downloadable PDFs. Along with that, we'll also provide you the mock tests. So for phase one, we will be providing you 10 mocks and for phase two, we will be providing you 10 mocks each for your English descriptive, for ESI as well as for finance and management. Along with that, this time we have added some printed material which will be delivered at your doorstep. This material comprises of some books like the question book for phase 1, for phase 2, the past year's book and a revision book for phase 2. So these are the benefits which you are going to get if you enroll for this course. This course has been launched at a 30% discount offer. So this is the complete course for 2022. You can use RBI 30 coupon code and avail this discount. For further queries, you can visit our website or call on this very number. So let's get started now. This is the very first question. In today's session, I have picked up some random topics which were currently in news in the month of February. So let us discuss these questions and along with that, I'll be focusing on the core concept as well. So the first question says, what does it refer to over here? So we have to identify the concept which is being talked about. Let's read these statements one by one. The first one says, it is a derivative contract that can help protect the investors from the risk of potential default by the borrower by swapping the credit risk with the financial institutions. So let us read the next statement as well and then we will discuss this concept. The second one says it allows the investors to recover the money from financial institution offering the hedging the risk in case the borrower defaults. So what is happening over here? A lender when has given some kind of a loan or provided some funding to the, to the borrowers fears that the borrower might not be able to repay the amount. So in order to protect himself, he approaches some financial institutions who are willing to swap the credit risk. So they are willing to take the risk on behalf of those borrowers okay so if borrowers will not repay then that institution will repay the amount to the lender so this way the head there is hedging of the risk of the lender that is his risk gets minimized or his risk gets reduced so this is allowing the investor to recover the money from whom from financial institution if i as a lender has given some loan to a borrower and i fear that that person will not repay me i will approach some financial institution which will swap the risk and in case the borrower will not repay me back, that institution is going to repay me. So what do we call such a derivative contract? By derivative, I mean any contract who, which, which derives it, its value from the underlying asset. The underlying asset could be your stocks, it could be your bonds. So I'll explain you how the bond related contract is being worked upon to help in the swapping of the risks. So first of all, let us answer this question. The derivative contract which offers this swapping of credit risk is known as a credit default swap. Why swap? Because it is helping in swapping the risk. Which kind of risk? Credit risk or the default risk. So in case the borrower will default, that institution from with whom you are swapping the risk will repay you. That's why it has been named as credit default swap. So the answer is option D. Let me explain you the concept of credit default swap. So what is happening over here? This is suppose a company. Okay. And this company needs some 
finance. So this company needs some funding maybe to uh, fund its different operations. It can go for some issue of shares, bonds, take loans, so different options are available. Let us take an example where this company is actually issuing the bonds. So this company issues bonds. Now here is a person, he's an investor, he has some money available with him and he wants to invest that. So he thinks to invest in these bonds. So by way of bond, this investor is going to provide the funding to the company. So this he is the investor, he has funding available. And what he wants? And he wants to invest. Right. So he thinks of investing in the bonds of this very company. Now, he can also go in for any other kinds of investment. But in this very case, we are discussing an example of say bonds. Now, when this person is providing the funding by investing in the bonds, the company needs to repay the money to the investor, both the principal as well as some interest. When the investor will get interest, then only he will invest. Why will he invest the money if he's not going to get any returns? So this company needs to repay the amount along with some interest to the investor. So this is the bond contract which is happening over here. But what is the catch in this very case? The investor thinks that the money which he is lending to these firms, they might not be able to repay them back. So there are high chances that the borrower will default. What are the chances that borrower might default and will not be able to repay the amount? So this investor is thinking what should be done now? He needs some kind of a protection. What he needs? He needs some protection from the risk of default. From which risk? From the credit risk, that is the risk of default. So what is the solution available for him? The solution is to go for the credit default swaps. Let me explain you this kind of a derivative contract. Now, when this investor fears that he might not be able to repay, recover the money from this company, he wants the protection that if this company will not repay, someone else will repay. So he want to swap his risk with some other company. So what is happening? This company ne bonds issue kiye and this person basically bought those bonds and by way of bonds, investor ne is firm ko kuch funding provide ki. But this investor is fearing ki ye company default kar jayegi and that company will not be able to repay the amount back to the investor. So isse is risk se related protection chahiye investor ko ki agar is company ne amount repay nahi kiya then we will have some other option to recover that amount. If this company defaults, that company will repay. So what is that contract? Let us discuss that, right? So this investor has an option. What he can do? He can approach some financial institution which is offering that facility. So he will be paying some periodic, he will be making some periodic payments or some premiums. He'll be paying what? He will be paying some periodic payments or premium and in return, this institution is going to provide the guarantee that in case the borrower will default, we will repay you back. So kya ho raha hai Ye investor kuch premium, kuch periodic payments kar raha hai to the financial institution. In return, financial institution promised to swap their risk with them. So ye institution repay kar degi investor ko in case this company will default. Such a contract of swapping your credit risk with some other institution, fearing that there are high chances of the default risk is known as a credit default swap. So I hope this concept is quite clear to you now. So why I am discussing this concept with you? If you are not clear, you can just draw these things and you will be able to understand it later on as well. So why I'm talking about this because it was recently in news that RBI has allowed the retail investors also to get the protection from the credit risk to hedge their credit risk by going uh, by using this very 
option of credit default swap. So who are the retail investors? There are some non-professional investors who are not having that much money nor that much knowledge like your other institutional investors like mutual funds, pension funds, insurance companies have. So retail investors have less amount of money to invest. Moreover, they are not having very thorough knowledge of different risks, returns associated with different products. They invest small amounts in a non-professional manner. In an unprofessional manner, they are investing uh, small amounts. So they are known as the retail investors. But they also need the protection from the default risks. So RBI has allowed them also to use credit default swaps, but only for one purpose, that is to hedge their risk to hedge their credit risk, basically getting the protection against the borrower's default. So this is whole concept of credit default swaps. If I move back to the question, I have already answered that the answer to this question is option D. Now let's move on to question number two. This is the second question which says, which of the following statements are correctly related to bonds? So we have to identify the correct statements. Let's just read the first statement and try to see that what is the concept we, which we have to cover before discussing this question. So the first statement says bond yields can lead to equity markets going low. Similarly, the second one also has something to do with bond yields and equity valuations. So what we have to do here, we have to identify the link between your change in the bond yields with the changes in the equity valuations. So let us discuss that concept first. The very first question which arises is that are your, are your higher or lower yields on the bonds going to change the perspective for the equity investors or not? That is, if the bond yields change, then will it impact the equity markets or not? The answer to this question is yes. In case your bond yields are changing, your bond interest rates are changing, it will obviously impact equity markets. Now let's see how. The very first thing which you should clearly understand is the concept of bond yields. What is it? It is basically the interest rates related to bonds. If I as a borrower is borrowing, I have to give some interest. Okay, so that is the cost for me. The interest rate which I have to pay to get some funding is the cost for me as a borrower. Now the ones who are investing in bonds, the investors, the lenders who are lending by a way of investing in bonds, for them the bond yield is basically the return which they will get. So what is it? For the borrowers, it is the cost which they have to pay, the interest rate they have to pay. And for the lender or for the investor who is investing in bonds, it is the return which they expect. So if for a borrower, say bond yield or the interest rate on bond is say 10%, it is less vis-a-vis -vis if it is 15%. Agar bond yield bar jati hai, if he has to pay 15%, then obviously the borrowing, uh, the cost of borrowing increases for him. Same way if I talk with respect to the investor, earlier investor was getting say 10%. Now if the interest rates rise and he gets 15%, obviously it is going to be it means higher return for him. So this is the concept of bond yields, which is the cost to the borrower and return to the investor. The interest rate, which is going to be the cost for the borrower and return for the investor is known as the bond yields. So this was the concept of bond yields. Now, if bond yields increase, well, how it is going to impact the equity? The bond yields, that is the interest rate on bonds, is actually the risk-free rate. So if we have to see the link between the equity and the bonds, one of the ways of understanding is, is through the cash flows. So if we have to value the stock, one of the ways of valuing stock is to find its present value. From the time value concept, you must be thorough with the fact that the value of money today is more than that which is going to be in future. That's the reason why we discount the future cash flows and we try to find the present value. 
So in this case also, there are different cash flows which may arise in future. So we use those future cash flows, we discount it using the risk-free rate of interest. This risk-free rate of interest is actually what? It is the bond yield rate as well. So if this interest rate is rising, that is, if this formula is and your denominator is rising, so how will he, it impact the whole fraction? If your denominator increases, your whole fraction will reduce. Ye whole fraction kya hai? This whole fraction is actually your equity or stock valuation. So if I is rising, if your interest rate rises, your denominator rises, your equity valuation ultimately falls. So this is the first connect between your interest rates and equity markets. When the risk-free interest rate is rising, the value which is assigned to the cash flows is actually dropping. And when that is happening, then obviously your equity is being valued at a lower rate. So rising bond yields imply rise in the risk-free rate, that is this. And when this rate rises, your value of liquidity lowers down. So this is the first connect. This was more of a more of a direct connect between your bond yields and your equity valuation. There is an indirect connection as well. So I'll explain you that also. So what is happening over here? If your bond yields are increasing, I told you that it is actually the interest rates. So the bond yields increase means your interest rates, that is the rate at which you are borrowing increases. So your cost of financing anything increases. So this is what is mentioned over here. Higher bond yields means higher interest rates. Agar aapki bond yields zada hai, that means your interest rates is high, are higher which increases your cost of financing any project or increases the cost of raising loans. Aapki borrow karne ki cost increase ho gai. Now if your borrowing cost increases, obviously you won't, you won't like to borrow. So if companies are not borrowing, fearing that the cost is really high, they will not have the funding. If the firms don't have funding, they won't be able to invest. Agar aap invest hi nahi karoge, if you are not investing, you will not earn profits. And shareholders are concerned of what? They are just concerned about the profits. So agar aapke interest rates are high, your cost is high, you won't be able to get the funding to invest because of which your profits fall and thus shareholders won't like to invest in your firm. But what happens in case your, so the same thing has been written over here, higher cost reduces the cost of borrow, increases the cost higher cost reduces the borrowings by the company because the things have become more costlier and it will lead to less investment, less profits and less returns for the shareholders. So shareholders will not invest in equity. Moreover, if why will any shareholder invest in equity if he is aware that bonds are offering him great amount of interest rate. Agar bond se usko zyada return mil raha hai, obviously he'll prefer investing in bond with V equity. So this is the catch over here. So if your bonds are offering higher yields, higher interest rates, investors will shift from the equity to bonds. So two things have been discussed over here. First of all, because of the uh, prospects that the firm will earn less profits and offer, rest, offer re less returns to the shareholders, shareholders will not demand much equity. So it will impact the demand of equity and thus the equity value. Moreover, investors will also prefer to shift to the bonds because of which the demand for equity falls and thus its value falls. So these two, that is the impact of cash flows. Um, and second one is the impact of high interest rates are two major reasons why with increase in the bond yields, the value of your equity lowers down. I hope both these reasons are clear now. So if we move back to the question and read these statements, we have to identify the correct ones. The first one says that the bond yields can lead to equity markets going lower. So as I have told you that if your interest rates increase on the bonds, obviously there are chances that your equity markets can go low. I explained two reasons for this. So this statement is correct. 
The second one says rising bond yields leads to lower equity valuation. So if your bond yields, the interest rates on bonds are rising, it will, it can lead to your lower equity valuation. A say, a, basically a different way of saying the same thing which is there in the first statement. The third statement says higher interest rates means lesser cost of financing. I explained to it you that this thing very clearly ki agar interest rates increase ho rahe, if your interest rates are increasing it means high cost to the high cost to the borrower and more returns to the investor. So higher interest rates means more cost of taking loans for the borrower not less. So they have written wrong thing over here. So this statement is not correct. The fourth statement says higher bond yields means lower interest rates for, for the investors. So they have written the opposite in the third and the fourth. This should have been written over here and this over here. So higher bond yields if the interest rates are high that means more returns, more returns or more interest rates for your investors. So this statement is again incorrect. The correct ones are only first and second. So answer is option C. Now let's move on to the third question. This was one of the uh, queries asked by students. They wanted me to explain this article which was recently in news. So I discussed the concept. Now let's move on to the third question. So this question says that the Reserve Bank of India digital payment securities controls directions 2021 are applicable to which of the following entities so recently in the month of feb rbi came up with master directions on your security control of digital payment systems so this was one of the initiatives which have been taken to give a boost to your fintechs you all know that we are uh, we have shifted a lot to the financial technology companies these days we are using technology in each and every aspect so in order to give give it a boost in order to make sure that the cyber security uh, is maintained the cyber crime risks are reduced we need a proper setup a proper infrastructure in place so this initiative has been taken by RBI to enhance your security controls with respect to digital payment systems so before answering this just let discuss in brief about these directions so if I talk about these directions they were issued on the RBI website officially on 18th Feb Within six months time period, some regulated entities have to adhere to these master directions. So what is the focus area of this direction? The focus area is on the mobile banking security, on the internet banking security to make to make sure that when one, one is making payments to the cards, then also the, there is a complete protection. So mobile banking, internet banking, card, card payment systems and other such systems have to be properly in place. So which are the entities which have to adhere to these directions? For the time being, certain regulated entities have been given this a task of adhering to these directions. So the name of this direction is Reserve Bank of India Digital Payment Security Controls Directions 2021. It is meant for the scheduled commercial banks other than the regional ruler banks, then the small finance banks, payment banks and credit card issuing NBFCs. As I have told you that card area is one of the focus areas so that has also been covered over here for the time being these four kinds of regulated entities have to follow these directions over time rbi is likely to expand the coverage area because we know that there is a great boost to the digital platforms these days so for the time being these are the applicability areas now further talking about what is the focus we need proper infrastructure to make sure that we can easily make digital payments then 
we need to make sure that if we are making a payment online our information is basically kept confidential then we need that in case we have any problem first of all there should be no problem no disruptions should be there we need such an infrastructure that no disruption arises but in case any sort of disruption arises what we need to make sure we need to make sure that our grievances are getting redressed in a very quick manner so the focus area is here on first of all identifying what are the risks associated with different digital platforms digital payment platforms then we have to identify that how can we mitigate or reduce those risks or manage them properly and thirdly we have to focus on focus on improving on the customer experience he should feel satisfied by taking any service so as i've already told you how can that be done we need to protect the confidentiality of the customer we need to make sure that proper infrastructure is there in place so that there is minimum customer disruption in fact we should move ahead to no customer disruption then we need a proper effective and efficient dispute resolution mechanism or the proper mechanism to handle the customer grievances so all these things are the focus areas you can uh, go to the rba website and study these master directions in detail where they are talking about that how they should have the infrastructure at time to time what areas they should work upon so these general directions have been issued for these entities and if they follow them then obviously it will help provide support to our very objective of promoting the fintech platforms so now let's move back to our question which says that uh, which asks us about the applicability of this direction so i've already told you it's applicable to your scheduled commercial banks other than rrbs your small finance banks payments banks and credit card issuing nbfc so all these are the applicability areas so the answer is option e which says all of the above now let's move on to fourth question so this is the fourth question which says RBI has re released a consultation paper on the introduction of concept of accredited investors in the Indian securities market. So, which of the following is correct eligibility criteria for your accredited investors who are Indian residents with respect to the factor annual income? So, what they are saying that RBI has come up with the concept of a accredited investor for securities market so these kinds of it is thinking to identify this as a special category of investors and different criteria have been specified that who is eligible to be a accredited invest a accredited investor so one of the fact factors to decide is it is the annual income so we have to identify the correct criteria let me first explain a bit about the accredited investors and what has sebi planned and then we'll move back to our question so if i talk about accredited investors you might confuse it with the qualified institutional buyers this was one of the categories of investors the qualified institutional buyers are the different institutions like pension funds insurance companies which are highly professional they have complete knowledge about the risks returns associated with different investment products and they invest a lot of amount in those areas but that was not meant for individuals so this term that is accredited investors is basically giving the qib that is the qualified institutional buyer status to your individuals as well so what kind of individuals will cover as i've told you that in qibs who were covered in qibs your professional investors were covered okay who have large sums to invest thorough knowledge about different finance products so that status which was earlier given to only the institutional investors now will be given to the individuals as well so accredited investors are also known as your qualified investors or your professional investors because of the area which they are going to cater to so being just like the qualified investors they will be able to take more informed decisions because they are professional and they have 
proper understanding of the financial products. Unhe pata hai that what are the risks, returns associated with different financial products, kahan hume invest karna chahiye, kahan nahi karna chahiye. So which investment is a better option? They are aware about that and they are able to make informed decisions. Um, so and they are basically if we talk about worldwide they have been recognized already and now SEBI is thinking to identify these investors in India as well. So now let's look at the criteria which SEBI has prescribed. First of all the paper is there still going on for discussion. It is open for public to comment that what are their views. So let us see the eligibility criteria. As far as the individuals are concerned, okay, with respect to their annual income, their annual income should be more than or equal to Indian rupees 2 crores. So 2 crores or more should be their annual income. If you have huge amount to invest, if you have thorough knowledge that where to invest, you are likely to be a accredited investor. Other than that, this was the annual income criteria. Other criteria is that if you have a high net worth of more than or equal to 7.5 crores and out of these 7.5 crores, some amount should be your financial assets. So 3.75 crores. So if you are in having such a huge amount of your net worth and a uh, lot of portion of that is invested in financial assets, that means you have proper knowledge. You are investing professionally in different financial products. So that is another criteria to identify you as an accredited investor. And the third is a combination of the two. So if your annual income is more than or equal to 1 crore and your net worth is more than or equal to 5 crores where at least 2.5 crore is financial asset then also you are an accredited investor. So either this, this or this. If you satisfy any of these criteria, you will be considered as an accredited investor. Similarly for trusts there is uh, some other criteria for other body corporates the criteria is something else. So this is the eligibility criteria which makes the Indian residents App, uh, basically eligible to be the accredited investors. Now why should one go for this option of accredited investors? Why SEBI is thinking to go about with for that? There are numerous benefits associated. So let us see some benefits. If I talk about from investors point of view, obviously there will be less restrictions on them. If you know that, okay, this is an accredited investor and this is a normal retail investor, you don't need much regulations for the accredited ones and you should regulate the other ones. So obviously less restrictions, less barriers. So they are likely to invest more. Moreover, some customized products could be offered to them. Okay, they are willing, they may be willing to take high risks. So you, you can offer similar kind of products to them. Then if I talk about the issuers, the ones who are actually issuing the securities, they will also be able to offer the customized products. So they can come up with some products which are more useful for the accredited investors and some simplified products for your normal retail investors. So accordingly, they can come up with the customized products, innovative products on which they can customize. They don't need to comply a lot. Lesser compliance costs will be there. Now, if I talk about from the regulator's point of view, obviously your burden will get reduced. Earlier you were say, suppose we had only 10 investors, okay, all of them being the retail investors. So you are focusing on all 10. Now we say that five of them are accredited investors and five are some normal retail investors. So you don't have to regulate them a lot. You have to focus on these more. Okay. So in that case, your regulation on these reduces. So regulatory cost reduces. You can channelize your energy on the other areas. So that is one of the benefits which you get by categorizing these investors. So this was about the accredited investors. If I move back to the question, we had to identify the eligibility criteria. With respect to annual income, it was more than or equal to 2 crores. Answer is option B. Right. So this was all for today's session. Some of you were having confusion that we are not covering current affairs. That is not at all with respect to your finance. That is not at all the case. I have been focusing on both 
brushing up your concepts, making your concepts stronger as well as on the current affairs part. I'll tell you how through different sessions I try to explain the core concept which will be helpful in the descriptive part. Then I cover different questions which will help you answer the objective questions. Other than that I have also updated the documents with some recent amendments. Let me share some examples like I told you that there is a cryptocurrency bill which is pending in one of my sessions on fintech then the government is planning to disinvest in different areas like the Indian oil corporation roadways railways it is thinking to go for asset monetization so I told you about that in the disinvestment session then I also cover the budget targets about disinvestment in the disinvestment session then there have been some changes on the monetary policy so what targets what should be the CRR SLR and what changes were suggested in the month of Feb I covered those in the monetary policy policy uh, uh, monetary policy session then what new audit based framework has RBI come up with for the NBFCs I covered that in NBFC ses session as, as well so in each and every session I tried to first discuss the concept and then move on to some current affairs so you should properly go through the entire session to have a complete knowledge about any topic this is the correct approach which you should have for any kind of exam First brush up your basics, understand the basics. It is going to help you for descriptive portion a lot. You will be able to understand the concept, explain it through the objectives, types, examples, and then you can quote the recent, uh, how it was recently in news, what recent actions have been taken in this regard. So this was all for today's session. I hope you found it useful. With this, I would like to end up this session. Thank you so much.